I want to welcome everybody. I want to first and foremost say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for taking the time out of your day, sharing your stories, um, and just making the time to be present with us. Um, my name is Janae Myers. I am the Chief Advancement Officer for Independent Living and Independent Home Care, and I'm going to be our moderator today. So uh, this is a value of home care fair pay for home care discussion. And I think that we've all come to know that New York has the largest of home care worker shortages in the nation. And this is because home care workers are paid poverty wages. And in a recent survey, one out of four people who qualify for home care cannot find the care that they need. And three out of four struggle to retain the care that they do have. So as New York population continues to grow in age, home care workers are going to continue to flee the sector and fair wages is the solution to home care shortage. So now more than ever, we really need to rapidly expand the workforce in order to meet the growing needs of our aging population and the population of people with disabilities who want to remain in their homes and in their communities and not institutions. We're here as a collective team to discuss the value of home care and how we can all come together to advocate for home care system and the support that is needed for our community. So together, we are comprised of the people who use home care, the families of the people who use home care, the circles of supports of those who use home care, the individuals who provide this essential service, the organizations such as independent home care um, that come together and advocate and support home care services. Also, Caring Majority is here, when, here with us, um, our lawmakers and those who have direct impact on legislation and who represent the needs of our community. So each of you fall into at least one of those categories. And what I would like to do after that little introduction of who we all are is have each one of you introduce yourselves. Um, what I will do so that way we're not kind of jumping across the screen and everybody having to throw it to the next person. Um, I'll just go in the order of my screen and I would love for you to just briefly introduce yourself, um, share your role or perspective in the home care ecosystem. So uh, Marie, you are on the top here. So let's start with you. Alrighty. So Marie Young, I am a, uh, what I, my, my title is Designated Representative of the Consumer. Um, I've been involved in trying to provide home care for aunties and my mom, um, probably started back in the 1990s. And that was a cakewalk because my aunt had the dollars for me to just pay my workers whatever I wanted. So that was not a problem. However, come the year uh, into the 2000s, then I had many people that I was taking care of. Um, had to go on to the Medicaid system, had to get a fiscal intermediary, and um, the challenge was great. So I've been doing this for probably over 20 years. Thank you, Marie. I know you'll bring a wealth of knowledge to this conversation <laughs> and experience. Um, Babby, you. you are next. Helps to unmute first. So, hi, I'm Babby Satsman. Um, I'm the manager of the uh, Consumer Directed Home Care Program here at Independent Home Care, or IHC as we abbreviate it. Um, and um, I've been doing this for 20 years. It's going to be come this February, very shortly. Um, and, um, you know, jumped right in and I've seen so many changes over the tw past 20 years through in this program and with Medicaid and the state. And um, I can't say that they're all for the better, but we've hung in there with this particular program that really gives people a lot of um, independence and, and uh, self-direction um, in, in the ability to hire there are people who they're familiar with or they become familiar with and they manage um, how that work is performed. Um, unfortunately, the Medicaid dollars have dwindled over the years 
Um, is anybody hearing me? Because I, oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, for various reasons, and we've moved into all kinds of the state thinking they would be able to save Medicaid dollars by privatizing and turning uh, the handling of the program over to managed care. And we all know that that's not happened and we're now in a great big Medicaid hole. So I don't, I don't wanna start this off on a depressing foot, but um, this is certainly a great group here, uh, representative of everybody involved, who the people who use the home care, who need the home care, the people who provide it, uh, and those of us who try to keep it going. Um, so I think, you know, we really have to work so hard, even much harder this year. Um, uh, state legislators who are on with us, we're, we're going to be knocking on your doors very shortly, and um, we need your help. We really do. So thank you. Thank you, Babby. Um... Your passion shines through already. <laughs> I can't wait to hear more of it. Um, Jean, you are next on my screen. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good morning. My name is Jean Gallagher. I am a legislative aide for Assemblywoman Aileen Gunther, who represents the 100th district in the state of New York which is all of Sullivan County and portions of Orange County. Um, I'm here on her behalf. And, uh, you know, I, I do a tremendous amount of constituent services um, here in the district. And so we see all the time um, situations where people are looking for, um, <clears throat> looking for care for their elderly uh, parents and loved ones and uh, the challenges that we, uh, that are associated with finding them help. And I also have many personal experiences as I took care of an elderly parent for many, many years myself. So I'm happy to be here, take copious notes and get all of that back to Assemblywoman Gunther. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be here with us and for sharing Pleasure. your personal experience. And Andy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andy Wyant. I am here kind of representing two fronts. I sit on the board of directors of our independent home care, which is a fiscal intermediary. And I'm also a consumer. So I'm here uh, on behalf of a couple different parts in this system. Thank you very much, Andy. And Julia? Good morning, everyone. I'm Julia Solo. I'm uh, the lead New York State organizer with Caring Majority Rising um, and, and have been working with many, many of you all on the fight for fair pay for home care. Um, so I'm excited for uh, this forum. And this is my colleague, Alana, who's in the same room as me. Yeah, I'm just coming over here to say hi, so I don't we don't mess up the sound. But Alana Berger, also with Caring Majority Rising, um, always love working with Independent Living Inc. and excited to be in this conversation with everyone. Thank you both so much. Um, we can resonate with that feeling of not wanting to mess up the audio. Um, Jess is actually here with me. She's next on my screen. And Jess can just, if you wanna elevate your voice and hopefully everybody can hear through my computer. I wanted to say hello everyone. My name is Jess Mario. I am the development and marketing assistant here at Independent Living. As Janae mentioned, we're in the same office across from each other right now. This is a fairly new role for me. Um, so I am excited to be here and listen and learn from all of you and hear your stories. Okay, sorry about that. We uh, have to play the little back and forth with the volume. And next on my screen is John. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Harper. Um, 
I am the systems advocate for independent living. Um, and I've been involved with the caring majority for a few years now, and I have the highest admiration for Alana and, and Julia and all of the members of the caring majority, which is, uh, in my experience, one of the most effective grassroots initiatives uh, that I've ever seen, um, as evidenced by the gathering of this group that we represent um, so many facets of uh, home care and the need for home care. Um, perhaps one of the more important uh, parts of my participation is that uh, I am an aging New Yorker. Um, and uh, one of the things that I wasn't prepared for um, was the need for assistance uh, in, <laughs> in my daily living. That as I age, I, I realize that my vision, my hearing, my mobility, um, all of those functions are diminished. And uh, what's so important to me in my life right now is remaining here in my home and where everything is familiar. Uh, as uh, next week, I'll be 77 years old, which I can't believe. Uh, but what is really important to me is, uh, as I say, all the things that are familiar um, and my home is set up in such a way that um, uh, I, I feel this sense of comfort in knowing that things are where they're supposed to be. And I speak on behalf of aging New Yorkers um, that they too must feel very much the same way. So it indeed is a privilege to be here. Um, I have the highest regard for Aileen. We go back many, many years. And Carl, who also goes back many, many years in terms of my relationship with them. They, they truly are our champions. Uh, so I appreciate their presence. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, John also brings a uh, the bridge for our advocacy and all of these efforts that we that we worked to put together um, all come with John's support. So thank you for that, John. And Lolly, you're next. Hi, my name is Lolly Edinger. Um, I live and work in the town of Olive in rural Ulster County. Been a home care worker for about seven years. I like to say that I became an accidental accidental home care worker. I was actually in outdoor education, environmental education. Um, after my job kind of switched, uh, I was asked if I would care for a friend's grandmother um, because of where we live. There's not a lot of uh, caregivers who are able or willing to drive that far. Um, so I did, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, I do have a, a, a background of, of caregivers in my family. My mom's a critical care nurse, um, retired. My dad, who was a farmer, I grew up on a farm, um, became a respiratory therapist. My mom took care of my grandmother and my grandfather at home. Um, they they were kept at home. They were taken care of at home and they passed at home. Um, so middle life and I found the job that I absolutely love and I want to make sure that other people can do it and can afford to to uh, do the job. Thank you, Lolly, and for bringing the generations of, of care. Uh, Doug. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, Janae, thank you for coordinating this event and thank you everyone for being here. I'm Doug Hovey. I'm the executive director for Independent Living, founding executive director. I've been around a couple of years. Uh, in fact, um, I remember when we first brought CDPA to New York State, uh, there were several of us grassroots advocates who uh, were looking at the model in other states and saw how effective it was and how important it was. And when we first got involved, it was literally prior to the legislation uh, advocating for the passage of Chapter 81 of the laws of uh, 1995. And, you know, subsequent to that, we became an FI because we so strongly embraced the consumer directed philosophy and movement. Um, and it's very consistent with the uh, mission of the independent living centers. There are 41 independent living centers statewide, all of which embrace the CD Pass model uh, and consumer direction in many, many different programs. Uh, we saw dramatic changes. I loved what uh, Marie said earlier uh, about her experience and, and watching the program become completely denatured over the last 20 years from a program that was actually functioning very well, where we were able to pay respectable rates um, and we were able to pay benefits and, and, and other types of compensation uh, to support a growing uh, program and, and network of, of home care workers. Um, around 2010, 11, we saw that change with the introduction of managed long-term care. Um, the, the problems, and, and, and I won't go into great detail right now, because I know we're gonna talk more about this and I wanna hear from many of you, um, but the problems are really structural in nature, you know, and it really, more specifically, it has to do with the financial incentives of the program. We really have to, we have to do something about the structure, the way that the uh, funding is appropriated to the managed care companies and then allocated to the providers. It seems that we're getting decimal dust and not enough to support our workforce. So I'm not gonna go into great detail now. I also wanted to say thank you to um, Jean, who's here on behalf of Aileen Gunther, one of our favorite um, folks that we've worked with for many years. And also Carl, uh, appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Doug. And thank you for making all of this possible um, through all of your hard work over the years. So I also now want to bring it to Assemblyman Carl Rabinek. Hello, good morning, everybody. Glad to be here with you today. I'm running back and forth in between session up here in Albany, but I'm listening in. And uh, again, thanks for having me. Big, big supporter over the years. And and we have a, a really awesome Hudson Valley delegation uh, that uh, that fights year after year to get this done. And, uh, you know, we're going to continue fighting this year. Whatever you guys need, uh, we're here and uh, ready to support. Um, and hopefully we can, uh, you know, get some big gains this year in, uh, in the budget process. Thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate your support over the years. And as you say, running back and forth, I just want to also call out that we did have about four other local representatives who did want to make it today. Um, unfortunately, they did have competing priorities, so they will be listening in at a later time. So we will definitely be sharing with them. So now, after all of your introductions, I want to kick this off with some questions. And I want to make sure that everybody is comfortable. If you hear something and you want to continue on with that and piggyback off of that, or you feel passionate about answering to, this is about you. This is about your voice. So um, please know that the floor is open for that, OK? Um, my first question, though, does go straight to Lolly. And Lolly, I'd like to know, as a personal assistant in the Consumer Directed Home Care Program, can you share your personal experiences regarding the value of home care and the impact that fair wages have on your livelihood? Thank you, Janae. Um, I want to start out by saying that I'm only able to do this job because I have a husband who provides me with insurance. He pays for the housing. He pays for most of the bills. Um, I mainly pay, am able to pay for the groceries um, and some smaller bills. Um, it is 
very difficult. I could not do this job if I was on my own trying to support a family. Um, I work with several people that are younger, that are excellent at the job, that love the job. But it's almost like you feel like you have to discourage them because they want to start a family. They want to own their own home. And you can't do it on the pay that we uh, that we make. Um, and that's that's discouraging. Um, and then because I live in a rural area, the travel time and trying to get places, weather that affects it, that only cuts into the pay. Um, but I love my job <laughs> and I want to continue doing my job. Um, and my job's valuable. Um, and I'm, I'm the person that's with them every day. I am lucky to have a job where I'm with them for longer periods of time. I know uh, many people are not given the amount of, are not given adequate hours. Um, so they may only get an hour here, a couple hours there. I'm lucky enough to work with people that um, right now I work 12 hour shifts, which I actually enjoy. <laughs> um, so I know them very well and it allows me because I know them so well to to know if there is something happening that maybe indicates a UTI is happening or maybe a pressure sore is happening or maybe they're starting to show more signs of seizures or something like that. Um, that one on one being with them day in and day out is healthcare. It is um, being there and maybe catching something early enough to prevent them needing to go into the ER, to go to the hospital, um, to go into longer term care in order to get um, something resolved that could have been taken care of if they had had, had adequate home care. Um, I've been working with, as I said earlier, I started working with a, an older woman um, and the goal was just to keep, she wanted to pass away in her home um, it's where she lives, where she grew up, and we were able to make that happen. Um, and that was important to me because my grandfather um, was the same thing. You know, we, I grew up in a farming family. Um, my grandfather wanted to remain on the farm, um, and my mom helped him do that. Um, but I've also worked with my friend's mother who had Parkinson's and dementia, um, and she just wanted as much independence as she could have. Um, and still, you know, and still deal with the health struggles that she dealt with. Unfortunately, um, she had some issues, ended up in a nursing home, um, for rehab. Um, and, uh, I will try not to get too upset, but she was not, she was basically warehouse, wasn't taken care of, um, and ended up in the nursing home with, uh, what we were told was there's no way someone could be that dehydrated um, without someone noticing. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, home care is the best way to take care of someone. Um, and she did pass away. Um, and then I also work with uh, and continue to work with, and I believe he's actually on and listening with a young quadriplegic man in his 30s. Um, who deserves to live in his own community, the community he grew up in, uh, be able to work uh, and not be warehoused. Um, these are people, these are not, uh, you know, these are not commodities. These are not things to make money off of. These are people who deserve to be independent and living in their own homes, just like the rest of us. Um, yeah, and, and I've always worked consumer directed. Um, I prefer that because I feel like it makes a, a, a stronger connection with the people that I work with because they're choosing me um, and they can continue to choose me if they so wish you or if we do not connect, they could let me go if they wanted to. Um, and I don't know where to go from there, except I, it's been the best job that I've ever had. I want to continue to be able to do it for as long as I can. Um, I am developing arthritis. It is hard on your body. Um, it is often hard mentally when you lose people or you're dealing you're, or you're working with people who are going through their own emotions. You know, you're right there with them. Um, 
but I want to make sure that the people coming up behind me, the younger people who love the job, that they'll be able to continue to do that. And then people that I work with can stay in their homes and not feel like they are outcasts and cast into nursing homes. Thank you, Lolly. And you mentioned the individual that you work with and yes, yep. he is on. And <laughs> that reminds me also to share with anybody who is uh, an attendee and not listed as a panelist here, you can absolutely join the chat, drop something in the Q and A. Um, we will either, you know, we'll find the best place to field those questions, whether that's during the conversation or afterwards. Uh, and we can also uh, provide permissions for you to speak if that is something that you would prefer in a means to ask your questions. Uh, there is also for anybody who does need, there's closed captioning options as well. So those are enabled. But um, thank you, Lolly, for bringing that up because I, I want to make sure that we welcome everybody here and know that this is, this is a community and um, each one of us impact the other. And um, I think that you spoke you know, very, very apparently of that and how, how we all are this, this web of supports and a community and, and hope and, and uh, we all work together. So thank I wanted you so to much. Add, I wanted to add to that, that support and that advocacy thing that um, I was never someone who could speak out to take a stand and, and advocate. Um, and it's only through this as I've been working with people um, and and realizing if I don't speak out, who isn't going to, you know, who else will. Um, and the support of I, I didn't say earlier, but I have become involved with Caring Majority um, because they do support that speaking out of everyone. It's very grassroots. It's, it's a coalition. Um, and if I don't speak out, who who. Uh, who will is kind of my mentality. So I appreciate you guys giving a space for us all to speak out. Thank you. And I want to stay on a similar topic and open this, I'll open it to anybody, but I do want to pose it to Marie and Lolly, but discussing the impact on caregiver livelihood, um, can you talk about what specific challenges do low wages present for home care workers and how might this affect the overall quality of care that's being provided? Okay, I'll jump in here, um, Janae, if you don't mind. Um, who wants to hire Lolly? I want to hire her. <laughs> she is like, wow. So, the, the thing about Lolly is that she already has a support system in place. She is financially able to do what she loves because, as she said, her husband provides the support system. So that that is not the norm, okay? So um, when you look at it from a, a, a DR point of view, I'm, I'm taking care of my many aunties, um, the challenge that I have going out to find good caregivers is that the talent pool is very, very limited because of the low wages. The low wages define that talent pool. Who will work for those dollars? That's what it is. Who will work for those dollars? And um, my experience tells me that um, it's a person who feels that they can get something else done while they're doing this job. So it is the, it might be the college student who can get their homework done, get their papers written, um, read their textbooks. I've had that person. Um, it can be the teacher who can get her prep time, like her lessons done. It can also be a, um, someone who wants a night off from the kids. It, and it can also be a caregiver, most often a caregiver who is showing up. This is her second shift or it might even be her third shift and this person is bone tired. So that, that is really the talent pool that you feel like you are drawing from. And um, I've had all of those types of caregivers. That was their scenario and it's, it's real. 
And I can honestly say that does not work. Okay. That's not a lolly. Okay. <laughs> this, my scenario, the, these kind of, these folks don't work. Caregiving is not their primary focus. And as a result, they miss things. Janae, they miss things. They miss my mom who very quietly wants to get out of bed and not disturb anybody who's actually working on their textbooks. They miss her. She gets out of bed with her rubber legs. She has a fall and she's on her way to the ED. And that's, that's how it, that's how it plays out. Um, maybe, you know, this time it was a fractured wrist. The next time it's a, a fractured pelvic bone, but it doesn't work. Um, it costs my mom. Okay. She is hurt not only physically, but emotionally. It costs the system. It costs the system because I'm using the emergency department. It's at the hospital. The ambulance had to come, um, you know, go ahead, Medicare, you're going to pay the, the bill for that. You know, Medicaid, you're going to, you're going to get your share of it. So it's, it, it costs, and it costs me personally, because now I have to reschedule. I have to schedule doctor's appointments, PT, OT, and I have to reshuffle everything for my mom's care and make sure that gets implemented just to deal with somebody who it is not their primary focus. So a caregiver that's not focused on caregiving, the thing is that they also fail, as Lolly said, is so important. They fail to build the relationship with their consumer. And that is so crucial because I think about when my mom or my auntie had to like just to maneuver to get to the toilet, afraid of a slippery, you know, bathroom floor, they are clinging to that caregiver. Lolly, I'm sure you know this. They are clinging and they are trusting totally in that caregiver to get them to the toilet, get them in the shower. It's a big thing. Um, and a very intimate to, thing. It is. It's a very intimate thing. And they need to be able to have that relationship. The caregiver has to be able to do that. So who do, who do we have? I need a caregiver who's focused on being a caregiver that sees the value in that role. That's what I want. And is compensated in a way that reflects the value that they are bringing to the table. That's what we need. Um, it's this, this is the kind of caregiver I want. And I have to also recognize that this comes with a price tag. It does. Okay. So um, that being said, when it doesn't, given the landscape out there, I need to, I <laughs> don't all have husbands like you love me, okay, right. <laughs> that can do this, but, but I have to, I, as the, the designated representative have to figure out how do I make that up? Fortunately, I am extremely fortunate to say that I do have focused caregivers, okay? But I have to make it up, okay? I do have extremely wonderful caregivers. They've been with me my, for like really honest, over 13 years, a lot of my caregivers, even during the entire COVID pandemic, they showed up. They are my heroes. They are my heroes. They never, they never missed a beat. My aunt, my aunt March, she's in her own home. She is the queen of her home. She's the happiest she could be. She's like, she is loving it every second. Her home is well-maintained as is her hygiene. Okay. So that's a big piece of it. Um, she, um, she was right side compromised because of her stroke, but she has, guess what guys, never had a fall. 13 years, never had a fall. Okay. Thank you caregivers. She has been to the um, hospital in all those years. Guess what? I can do it on one hand and it's this many. I do have five fingers, but it's this many times. Okay. So that is to me, my gratitude to these caregivers extends beyond words. Bottom line, as a consumer's DR, you figure out a way to supplement the wages and you use every tool in your management toolkit to engage your caregivers, to communicate the true value that they are. And guess what? When you do that, everyone wins. My mom, the system, the caregiver, and me. <laughs> and I can I can add to that too, um, since Zach spoke up in the chat. Um, Zach is 
uh, the the young younger guy with quadriplegia mm -hmm. that I care for. Um, mm -hmm. And in my past, I wore an HR hat. Um, so I am almost always with him now when he interviews people, uh, just because I think of some of the things that maybe wouldn't normally come up, although he's a professional, he's been doing this long enough now. Um, but you're, you're absolutely correct on the, the talent pool because of the wages. Um, he has had some that have come in that he's, he's had to settle. Um, it would not have been someone he would have hired. Um, but he has 24 seven care and he needs someone in his house. Um, and I live right down the road and I was, I would get burnt out because I, I couldn't not be there if he didn't have someone there. He is now also family. Um, so he would hire someone and they wouldn't have a car or they wouldn't have a reliable car. Um, or they, uh, we're very selfish. Um, and so like, well, I really want to go and do this today. So do you want to go with me or are you going to stay home by yourself? I mean, these are literally some of the things that were said. Um, yeah. and, and it comes down to money. And, it, and that's understandable because really someone who is a true caregiver wants to be able to do the, the job but they got to pay the bills and if they can't pay the bills that's and it's not just that and i believe D doug brought this up at one point there aren't the benefits except for mandated sick leave because of the pay and because of the reimbursements to the to the agencies um and a lot of us like i have to depend on if i want to go i'm going in uh in a couple of weeks down to visit a, a niece's baby that i haven't met before my husband's going to have to cover the time that I'm not working because there are no uh, uh, vacation time. Um, and it, it really is a matter of what, how much can you settle? Um, Zach does a wonderful job of making us feel part of the family. He has, he has, um, he's done a lot of stuff for us that he can, but, he, you know, he lives on Medicaid and Medicare also. So it's, it's very difficult. Um, and for a lot of us, we end up just feeling if it wasn't for Zach and the other people we work for, we would, and, 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 uh, independent home care, uh, because I can tell you Babby and Janae and stuff have, and people have really made me feel valued. Um, you, I would be so depressed. I would feel just like, I want to give up. Um, but it's them that have kept me going as well as my husband. So I always want to make sure people are aware that I'm speaking up for the people who can't. Yep. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And I think that one of the things that you both um, hit on so well is this ripple effect, right? So the effect that we all have on each other on the system, on the economy. And when we focus on the, the positives, then, then we can have this positive ripple effect. We can make sure that we keep people in their homes, that we love the job that we do, that we have these caregivers, that we have the people that we love taking care of, and that we as people who need care or will one day need care have that set in place and and that's a really positive ripple effect that can take place and with that i would love to hear from somebody who does use home care and what this impact has for you so andy i would love to pose a question to you of as a consumer in this program how has the ability to choose your caregiver impacted you and your independence and what concerns or what concerns do you have or not have looking forward? Well, thank you for allowing me to speak here on my behalf as a consumer. Let me just share a little bit more with you about my life. Uh, I've lived, I got hurt really, really young and I've lived for the last more than 38 years with quadriplegia. I am very active in the community. As I told you before, I sit on the board of independent home care. I also own my own 
financial planning business, and I'm active in my hobby of amateur radio. I also love getting out and about, uh, seeing concerts, live music. But I just love being out and about, especially when it's nice, getting into the woods. It just love doing what I used to do in a different way. Without this consumer-directed program, I would not be able to pick and choose the people to come and help me that would do these types of things with me and help me to do these things. Uh, if, if I went with a traditional um, agency that provide AIDS, most of those agencies don't allow the AIDS to drive my vehicle. Um, I, I'm, I, they do that for me and with me, for me, uh, through this program. And right now, thankfully, I am covered with all my needs and pretty much all my hours. But that's only because I'm actually paying out of my pocket extra $2 an hour to help these folks to want to actually come work for me. Otherwise, they, 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 don't, they, want, they don't want to be here. Some, some, will, some would do it for that, but they don't want to because they are not, for a lot of the reasons, all the reasons that Lolly talked about, she, you know, you can't make a living wage off of this. And it's really would cut down on my choices. It's all about choices. This allows me to have the choices to do the things I'd like to do. And if this wasn't here, uh, it would severely limit a lot of these things that I'm able to do. And I am extremely scared to go into a nursing home uh, because that easily is what could happen. And the stagnant pay and unfair wages is, for this specific program, I'm going to get into it later, possibly, but this program is abysmal at what they've done to it. Not good. Can I just pop in and say also with this program, um, one of the things we haven't talked about, and for most of us, um, we're in an area where it wouldn't necessarily, um, but I think uh, uh, Alana and Julia might talk about it a little bit, but with Sadie Panny, the governor actually proposed in her budget um, to get rid of the wage parity uh, for those in the downstate uh, area in this in the city and Long Island and Westchester, I believe. Um, and what that does is it adds a little bit extra money. It, it it makes things a little bit more even for the higher living expenses, et cetera, down there. Um, and that is going to places that are already struggling to find uh, people through consumer directed where they can hire their own. And as, as, as Andy said, you know, we can drive, we can do a lot of things that otherwise the person ends up housebound or, you know, they're not able to be truly independent. Um, and that taking that away may force a lot of people to go to an, an agency, taking away their own ability to hire their people. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's going to do a lot of real damage for what they've fought for to get uh, a little bit better care. I mean, we're not even close to being at good care, but at least to make it a little bit more uh, competitive because caregivers are being lost to uh, jobs that pay benefits, um, that pay better pay, that you can live on. Um, and that's that's extremely important coming up for those, especially that live um, further downstate. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I was actually going to open the discussion for everybody to, you know, take an opportunity to answer um, perspectives on the landscape of the home care. I could add to that too. Workforce. Yeah. So please, Andy. I, oh. I mean, I, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Uh, the, there's other programs that the governor Gladly supports OASAS, uh, Office of Mental Health, 
and OPWDD with much better uh, wage wages. I, I, in some cases, not every single case. In some cases, uh, workers there are able to get paid some benefits. And I think in just, just this year's budget, she actually enabled a cost of living adjustment for one of the one of the uh, departments, OMH. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I, I mean, this is brutal. I'm going to be honest. I feel that we are. This is kind of like the bastard chep stepchild of Medicaid, one of the Medicaid programs. Don't care about this type of these type of workers. I don't know why. I agree. I agree, Andy. What my feeling is, is that in her mind, and I may be incorrect, but I I don't feel that I am, that she is looking at it as a CDPAP being one little aspect that um, family, you can hire your own family. And there is such a history of caregivers being unpaid, unappreciated, used, yeah. And and like you are required, that is your job to do. And we all know caregiving is not easy. We all have our own things that we need to do. It is the people that can come in and care for our family members, as I'm sure Marie is very aware. Like that allows you to, it's not like Marie is going to get away with like being able to go out and party. She's making those appointments. She is like, <laughs> she's organizing all of this. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure that it is that, that old thinking that you should take care of your family and do it without complaining. We don't have that kind of society anymore. We don't have the supports that were built in then, like my mom taking care of my grandparents. There was a much more support then. We don't have that now. And I really feel like that's what it comes down to is that little bit of, well, they should they should do it because they should. You need two incomes. <laughs> you need two incomes. I don't know why she doesn't say that to the other other about the other programs and the workers in those programs. My moment of silence here is just to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to get these um, feelings out. You know, I think that we're talking about um, the the facts, um, but also. I want to make sure that you have the space to talk about how that makes you feel. So if, if that's something that anybody wants to touch on a, on a personal basis or, you know, I, I would be happy to open the door for that as well. Um, if I might just take a minute, uh, because as I said in my introduction to myself, um, I've been doing this for, for 20 years and, We've seen a lot of changes and, and some for the good, but many, many not. And when I first started, um, I remember, you know, having all of this passion inculcated about this program and why it works by Doug. And one of the first things to be pointed out was it costs so much less than it uh, to have somebody stay in their own home and be a productive citizen then go into a facility and maybe only live two years and, and it costs twice that to for, to keep somebody in the facility. And I think we've just lost sight of that no matter how much we carry on and talk about it. I think that the government has just lost sight of the fact that, you know, if you want to look at dollars, this is the most cost efficient already without making cuts to it most cost efficient, not to even mention the fact that people deserve to have their independence and live in their own homes, in their own communities. And going back to the cost thing, and when you remove somebody from a community, you're removing, removing some of the tax base. That person isn't going to be spending dollars anymore in um, you know, their local area. So this has just really um, infuriated me over the years that we have very much lost sight of 
um, and, the, and the, when managed care came along, it seems to me like it just, it, it, oh, okay, well, the managed care insurance plans, what, oh, this is a great program. Now we, you know, if we can't fill a light, uh, spill a, a home care spot with a licensed home care agency, you know, we'll just tell somebody to go hire their own. And it, it, this is, and so it increased the growth exponentially of the consumer directed program. Not that it shouldn't have been, but that is the one figure that then the government looked at. They didn't, they didn't look at it in relationship to how much they were um, not spending on, on uh, uh, skilled nursing facilities, but just, oh my God, the consumer directed program has just grown. And um, there was very little care about who could be in this program and who couldn't and, wh and what the program was really all about. And so I think that that's come to the forefront and, and to the, you know, the governors, whoever they have been, um, that seen just those figures and panicking about it and not really taking a look at where the, the cost savings are in terms of Medicaid. So um, that's what I wanted I want to jump on what Babby said also, as far as like, you know, the people them being taken out of their community. Um, I've talked quite often about um, within our town, you know, it's a it's a, a small rural town. The healthiest communities are those that have a, a across the board representation. So you've got younger, you've got disabled, you've got older, you don't have a homogenous uh, community. As we take our older people out and our disabled people out, people forget that they're part of our world, part of our life. And it becomes even easier, I think, for politicians and other people to just kind of push them aside. Um, so we've been talking a lot in, in my town about how to keep our community members in our community to keep it a healthy uh, stratification across all abilities, across all ages, in order to have a healthy community. And that does end up, and I hate always having to come back to a lot of, a lot of people, and I'm gonna say mostly politicians, um, but I hate having to come back to the money, but a healthy community means a healthy economy. Um, and I think that's something we need to be pointing out also is that 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 plays into our how our community health is how our community economy is thank you so much this is awesome i want to keep having this conversation so as you guys will uh know it's 11 58 we're set to end at 12 i don't want to end so if you have a couple extra minutes i'd love to keep you here um with us because i think that this conversation is uh vital to the the future of um supporting this program and every the landscape of um, services and supports and advocacy for people with disabilities and older adults. So if you have that time, please stay with us because I would love to now turn this over a little bit to Julia at Caring Majority. I want to know um, with everything that we just discussed and all these passionate responses, um, we, we need solutions, right? We, we need help, we need support, we need some call to action. Um, what does the caring majority rising see? What are what are some potential alternatives or solutions that are uh, that are out there for us? So uh, thank you so much. And I just this conversation is amazing. Um, so many uh, great insights. Um, I think that like right now, it seems like all of us are really scrambling for crumbs, right? There's cuts coming for, you know, home care. There's cuts coming for our schools, right? Um, there's a major scarcity mindset, I think, right now. Um, and I think one, you know, one solution is like, we can make the pie bigger, <laughs> right? There's enough, there's enough pie to go around. There's so much money in New York. We have over 130 billionaires who live in New York State state that's more than anywhere else in the world 
Um, and we're not proposing any increases for their taxes this year. Um, there's a campaign called Invest in Our New York, um, which is working to uh, fight for revenue raising through the Invest in Our New York Act. Um, and so I think there's big possibilities for revenue raising um, on the state level, on the federal level as well. Um, you know, we in 2021, for the first time probably in history, had a president who was calling home care infrastructure. Um, you know, he was proposing in the Build Back Better uh, stimulus package, he was proposing $150 billion for improving pay for home care workers. Unfortunately, that got cut out um, in, you know, final deliberations, it got cut out. Um, but I think, you know, progress is is being made um, nationally, even um, in the recognition of investment in home care as something that, that is just vital and important. Um, and so I think we need to think about what I think we need to convey to our legislators the importance of, of raising revenue. I think that we need to hold the line at fair pay for home care. What's the cost of not passing fair pay for home care, right? Um, and, uh, you know, home care is the more affordable option, right? When you compare it to nursing home care, that's been said before, it's $10,000 a month for a private room in a nursing home. Um, and so uh, there was a, a CUNY report that estimated um, that fair pay for home care would actually save the state $4 billion in cost savings um, and revenue. Um, and so um, I think that we should hold the line at fair pay for home care, fight for revenue raising. Um, and whether you have a small amount of time or a little amount of time, like you can play a role um, in this movement and in this fight. Um, I like to break down ways you can take action into sort of three categories. There's power building, direct action, and storytelling. Power building is where you're bringing more people into the movement. You're holding info sessions. You're inviting people to join us um, and you know advocate with our legislators. Um, there's direct action, which is when we bring our demands to our legislators, whether it's in a meeting or in a protest. Um, and then storytelling, right? If, even if you have the smallest amount of time, you can tell your story. Um, you know, you can share that, uh, your story in a letter to the editor. Uh, you could share it on social media. Uh, you could be part of a speaker's bureau um, for interviews with the press. Um, and so um, I'm gonna just drop a few links in the chat um, and uh, wanna raise that there is a lobby day on February 12th that I believe a lot of folks here are coming to. It's the CD Panny's Niall Lobby Day. Um, and so I'll put information on that in the chat if you're um, able to make it up to Albany. This is a great, another great way to, um, to advocate and push for change. So thank you so much for having us here. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, it was actually my time connecting with Julia and planning for our home care um, mixer last year that I got to know Julia and I got to know more about the caring majority and everything that you guys are doing and how we come together as this collective um, that that brought us to the kind of this idea, brainchild, um, <laughs> of getting everybody together today and having this conversation. So thank you so much for that. And um, if you, I know you have another meeting, but if anybody does have the time, um, I'd love to also kind of just touch on, and you started, but the the value and the importance of um, the legislative support in this process and ensuring the well-being of both the caregiver and the person receiving the care and how legislation can really help shape that. And Babby, I don't know if you want to touch on that or if you had a well, different... I have a, I, I have this burning question to a legislator. I, uh, if if um, Assemblyman Bravenek is still on with us, I'm not sure. But what is it going to take to get 
all of the legislators, not just you and, and Aileen Gunther, have always been understanding and on our side about this, but to, to make everyone, including the government and the Office of the Budget, see how more cost efficient this is, really look like at the numbers that Julia Solo was just talking about and about how much it it it, it does cost to, uh, to stay in a, a skilled facility versus, I, I just don't know, what will it take for us all to get all of you, all of the legislators on board and and push it um, to the to the budget office more than even the governor. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that question went out or not, and if it could ever be answered. <laughs> Unfortunately, you, you uh, what we found out the last couple of years, you could get every legislator on board. The governor has the ultimate decision. That's what it comes down to. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I definitely feel like it's the power dynamic. Um, you know, we were uh, with fair pay the first time around. We were in both budgets. And then it got to the three people behind the door and it went where it went. Um, but I I think that if we, you know, we, we're definitely making inroads. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm at the hope now of getting passed it to a, even a new governor um who may be much more aware of the cost savings and the and and the respect to the people that uh it it affects um because this isn't going away i mean it's not like we're all going to sudden going to stop aging it's not like people are stop going to stop having illnesses or accidents um and you know, so many of them like to brag that this is New York. We're the leader in things. Well, we're the leader in the worst home care in the state or in the nation. And I don't I mean, I know a lot of it comes down to uh, the power of insurance agencies and, and other ones that have a piece of the pie. Um, so it might come down to figuring out how to change that uh, power dynamic. Um, but it, something's going to break. And I'm hoping that it's the reinvestment in home care and not, you know, people. Hmm. Thank you, Lolly. And um, can I just say something? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. This is Jean from Aileen Gunther's office. Um, is it okay? Please. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, just a couple of quick things. First of all, thank you so much to the folks um, from Independent Living. Um, we call on them a lot uh, in our constituent work and we thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do. Um, I've taken some pretty copious notes and I'm going to, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to jump off. We are back to back um, with meetings and Zoom calls. Um, Please come to the lobby day if you can. They make a difference. They really do. And I know it's not that easy to do that. I'm a messenger today. And I, as I said, I, and I mean, I, I've had this personal struggle myself. So um, I, as I said, I, I, she's, she's an advocate. You know that. Um, but um, I'll make sure that this gets in the front of her, in the front of her. <laughs> and um, do what we can to make the changes that are needed. Jean, thank you. Can I just jump in just for I do. Uh, thanks so much uh, for your support. And again, our best to the Assemblywoman. Uh, and I just want to mention when we first started the Fair Pay for Home Care campaign yep. several yep. years ago, uh, I remember it was Assemblywoman Gunther. As soon as we mentioned home care, she stopped us and said, the most important part of health care is home care, you know, and I'll never forget that. In fact, we've quoted her many, many times. So our thank you to you. Thank you to Assemblywoman. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you on the 12th. Absolutely. I look forward to seeing all of you on the 12th. Thank you for having me. With your permission, I'm going to jump. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye now. Bye-bye.
So, um, I, you know, and I think a couple of people have said this, but we, we often do have our supporters in front of us and who join us and, um, elevate our message and, and amplify our, our voices. And that's so appreciated. Um, but together we also need to make sure that we're sending this message message, um, and resonating with the, um, decision makers and the people who ultimately have the power to change the system. So with that, I want to know if there's any other key messages or actions that any person here would like to leave us with. Um, oh, I see that you have your hand raised. Yes, please. Yes, no, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us today on this. Uh, very, very important to keep the message out there. Um, and like I said, we have a, a really, really great delegation uh, in the Hudson Valley that fights for this every single year. And unfortunately, you know, it's it's ridiculous that we have to keep asking for this because I think this is basic common sense. We want, um, you know, people to have the care that they need at their homes, not in a facility. I mean, it's better to, you know, have it at their homes. It's the most important thing. So, uh, you know, we're going to keep fighting for it. We're here uh, for everybody, and um, you know we're gonna keep pushing it in our one house budgets. Um, ultimately, hopefully, it's in the final budget to to assist wherever we can. And um, you know, with whatever needs or concerns you have, our doors are always open, um, and uh, we're ready to help. So again, thank you very much to everybody for fighting this fight for so many years, and and hopefully. Uh, you know, we're going to come to a conclusion soon on this. Carl, thank you. And I appreciate you always being right there alongside of us fighting the good fight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug. You're a good friend. And uh, thank you for doing what you do. Thank you so much for putting us in your busy, important schedule and, and making this a priority. No problem. Anytime. Can I just bring up uh, one additional thing that um, may it plays into the fair pay? Um, we do have right now in both the Assembly and the Senate uh, a bill called the Home Care Savings and Reinvestment Act. Um, and the reason this can play in the fair pay is what it's looking to do is actually carve out home care from these MLTCs. Um, because we know one of the biggest things that's uh, happened is we get, you know, a dollar here, well, two dollars here, one dollar here. It goes into the black box, which are, are the MLTCs, and doesn't appear on the other side um, to our or to our FIs, and you know, and then, but they're mandated to pay the, us these increases. Um, so this bill is actually looking at carving it out and bringing it back to the state um, because they're also. From what I'm learning, I'm learning way too much about how politics work. Um, but, I'll, you know, from what I have found out is that the current setup, they can actually investigate and go in and hold them responsible. Their hands are tied when it comes to that. So carving this out would bring that money back into the state and then they would set up a new system, uh, an, an independent uh, uh board or whatever you would want to call it that would manage it and it would be transparent where the money's going how it's going and then hopefully be able to say these savings can come back into uh the wages for uh for our home care workers um so that's new if you're not familiar with it you know caring majorities talking a lot about it um we can get you information about it but it, it is something that um, hopefully we'll be able to support the Fair Pay for Home Care uh, campaign. Uh, thank you very much for that. I was going to ask for the bill number, but I see it in the chat. So thanks for putting that on there. Um, taking a look at it, that's uh, Amy Paulin bill. Uh, there's one co-sponsor, Linda Rosenthal. Uh, we'll make sure that we add our names as a co-sponsor. I'll push this bill in the Republican conference, too, to try to get some more co-sponsors. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then it looks like it is, um, as of January 18th, it was referred to the health committee. That's so correct. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's definitely important uh, for anyone on this call 
to contact the chairman of the health committee, which let me check who it is. If anybody knows who it is, just shout it out. That's cool too. Uh, but I'll check right now on who that is. And then if you reach out to the health committee chair, they can push that through the committee and get it on the floor. And then we can, uh, you know, really push it through. Uh, the Senate definitely... it looks like Senator Skoufis is a co-sponsor as well. Oh, well, that's that's good to hear. And I know he's yeah, he he is a co-sponsor um, and it's definitely bipartisan. I just got off a call last week um, on the Senate side with Senator Oberacher, who happens to be my senator. Um, and he's always been very supportive and he's getting ready to uh, sign on um, uh, with the Senate bill. So, yeah. Actually, um, and that's, that's what I always push. This is bipartisan. This is a human absolutely. issue. This is not one hundred percent. And you know, we have um, you know Democrats and Republicans that float into this office. Um, there's actually uh, three assemblymen right now in the other room, so I'll let them know about the bill. See if they can sign on to that as well. And uh, it looks like Senator Oberacker is a co-sponsor as well. Senator Hinchy is on there. Uh, let's see. Well, that's good to hear. I haven't even met with Hinty yet. I have a meeting with her uh, at the end of the week. So oh, great. Yeah, <laughs> that's no, wonderful. Thank there. you for the news. <laughs> yeah, she's on there. There's Republicans and Democrats on this bill. Um, so that's good in the Senate. In the Senate, it looks like um, it is also in the Health Committee as of uh, two days or actually, yeah, two days ago. Um, they amended the bill and then recommitted it to the Health Committee. So um, that is there in the Senate. And yeah, so we'll um, we'll contact Amy Paul and try to get on that bill. And uh, we'll also encourage a lot of our other colleagues to get on there too, to try to push it forward. Above Thank and you, beyond and on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything else before I ask my final question, if there's any key messages um, or feelings or anybody, uh, does anybody want to share anything before uh, we wrap up? Um, Janae, can I just make one point? Okay. <laughs> you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, we're talking about these managed long-term care companies and I will tell you right now, I'm leaving this meeting and I'm going to see my aunt, another auntie who's 92 years old today. She is in a facility. It, it breaks my heart. Okay. She, she is likely someone who thought that I had her back, but the truth of the matter is when I needed the home care, she couldn't toilet herself. She couldn't take care of herself. I was evaluated by the, the evaluator who did the assessment and said, you can have 48 hours a week. Of home care 48 hours a week that's less than seven hours a day and i appealed that decision i got an additional four hours so now it's up to 52 hours i could not i could not come up with the dollars to cover the 116 hours that were left for her care and i had no choice but for her to go to a facility because I, I appealed it, I tried, Babby was with me and the staff at IHC. I think you probably remember, I was tortured because I we didn't get enough. And now I'm, I'm going to see her for her 92nd birthday in a facility because that's, that is really what happens. You can, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a money tree in my backyard. I do not have a GoFundMe page for my aunties. I have leveraged a lot of things taken out home equity loans that I've signed my name to. I have drawn from my re retirement account. I've done everything to try to keep my aunties and family at home. And it, it's, it is a big strain because the, the pay is not there for these people. And you, you have, you want good caregivers, you need to put your money where your mouth is <laughs> and you need to demonstrate in a real way that they do bring value to the table because there's, there's their, what their, their contribution is priceless, absolutely hands down priceless. And we just are not valuing them the way that we need to. Thanks. Jenny. Yeah, I'm Thanks glad, for doing I'm 
Thank you. I'm glad Marie brought that up because that's something we didn't really touch on is just the how severely they they're cutting the hours also. And that is one of the biggest reasons that my friend's mother ended up in, in the nursing home also. Um, mm -hmm. So um, my love's going to you, Marie, because that's, it's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a rock and a hard place. And it's, it's breaking my heart. I got, I kept everybody else out. I have kept everybody in their homes and this one I couldn't do. It, the gap was too huge. It's absolutely, how do you, how do you cover like 116 hours that are really needed? I, I just couldn't do it financially. And it, it, I'm on a guilt trip every day for it. Well, yep. you shouldn't be, Marie, because you have certainly no, done. but it's, it's reality. <laughs> you've, you've done um, wonderful. I mean, we want, we here in the office, we, we work with you, but we watch you. We, you, you are phenomenal. And you too, Molly. <laughs> you know. See, there she is, my biggest fan, <laughs> my biggest supporter. <laughs> yep. But. Thank you, Babby. <laughs> and I'm a fan of Babby too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love her. Come on. <laughs> that whole team. <laughs> Not really, just just there with my passion and pushing. <laughs> and loving it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And the the passion resonates with with me and it reverberates through all of us and I I really want to ask just one last question and Andy if I could just start with you um what does home care mean to you yeah sure um uh, it means that I I've, I have the ability to have choices choose who comes into my home how they take care of me uh allows me to choose you know what i feel like going out to dinner tonight i have somebody here uh to choose that to, to be able to make that choice i mean it means independence which is the same type of thing uh allows me to be like an able-bodied person to do what i want when i'm able when i want when i'm able and where i want it. if uh you know as long as that person is willing to do that stuff which most of them are. And it also means the ability to stay, help stay healthy without, as Lolly said, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like full-time work to make sure we stay healthy and stay out of the hospital. So that's, that's kind of in a nutshell, really what it is. Yep. Thank you. And Marie, you've shared a lifetime of stories um, and stories that continue to this day and happy birthday to her. Um, <laughs> but can you, what does home care mean to you? It means giving people the life that they want. Just as Andy said, it's, um, gosh, they so deserve to be in, in the home that they want to be around things that are familiar. Um, it's just, it allows us to love them how they want to be loved. That's, I don't know how to put it any better. That's, you, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what's important to them and how do we love them in that way? You couldn't have said it better. Thank you. you. Thank you for doing this. And Lolly, what does home care mean to you? It means doing a job that I love. It means helping people, uh, live dignified, respected, be respected, um, independent. Thank you. And I will now open that up to anybody else who does want to answer. Babby, John, Doug, Carl, I don't know if you're still there because you're so busy. But <laughs> I think we heard the call to action a little earlier on February 12th. It's important that we show up in force uh, to represent the interests of all of the, the comments and the folks that you, you heard today. But also, we want to we wanna propose solutions, right? The Home Care Reinvestment Act is, is a solution. And I think if you were to talk to any grassroots advocates who were instrumental in bringing this program to New York back in the 90s, um, and every one of them would agree that restructuring of the way 
uh, home care is administered in the state at the state level is critical. Um, we've seen the changes since 2011, as I said before, from going from a fee for service program to uh, one that is managed under a managed care system. Uh, it's not working. Something's got to change. So uh, speak up, be vocal, show up. Uh, let's continue to have these forums. Um, and certainly independent living will support these events uh, to the best of our ability. Thank you so much, everybody, for your passion and your advocacy. I hope everybody has a wonderful you. rest of your day, and I look forward to February 12th. Okay, see you all. I'll see Thanks. you in Albany. Thank you. See you in Albany. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks for being there for us. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Very again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.